Hey everyone, hey everyone, welcome to today's show. Uh, this is the show where we talk only about game industry, game makers, game publishers, and service providers in the game industry. This is a show where you have a chance to learn everything you need to build the best game in the world. And today is no different than any other day, except we have the biggest company in the world when it's come to security, tracking, and basically being just special provider. Today with me is a special serial entrepreneur, founder, the true builder, one of those that is so rare today to have for discussion. It comes from a very special background and his previous work is Oracle and his own companies that got sold to some of the biggest brothers in the world. It's my pleasure to introduce Charles, founder and CEO of company Kochala. Charles, welcome to our program. Awesome, thanks for having me, it's terrific. We're here in Beijing and we are just curious to learn more about how your whole journey started. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to university days at uh, Papa Dean, right? Pe Pepperdine. Pepperdine. Yep. And uh, what interests you had when you were in university? How did all things started for you? Or yeah. Well, Pepperdine was fantastic. If anyone's done any research, um, Pepperdine is a, a fantastic um, institution. It um, is probably best known that it happens to be on the shores of Malibu in California. And so um, the, the view is not terrible. It's a pretty fantastic uh, place to go to school. Uh, built some uh, fantastic relationships while I was there. I, I would argue Pepperdine was terrific uh, from a number of different areas. Um, but where like my passion really started was well before I was in college mm -hmm. and I think a little bit unique um, I didn't go down the path of um, uh, kind of following my passions into college and what I mean by that is I was very interested in software I've been programming since I was um, uh, an early teen and um, taught myself uh, a number of different languages early on uh, ended up building a, a billing system for my mom's company, which was a telecom company that um, bought and sold uh, long distance. So you events. were an entrepreneur before you even went to the college, is that right? Yeah, well, I, you know, entrepreneur is probably a bit of an extent, uh, an extension on it in that um, I built it. It wasn't like I was building a billing system company, but I was doing it um, and it was a fantastic opportunity for me. Uh, and a great one for the for for, my, for her company, um, but but what I discovered, and this is kind of the important point, is that I really love software, and I I had a, a pretty significant amount of clarity that my life was going to be surrounding by software, but the industry in which I work in was a was an X factor, was a variable. But at the end of the day, it was going to be something related to software because I was just so interested in how it all kind of put together. Did you have any mentor back in those early days or somebody? Did you have anybody to learn from? I, I didn't. Um, I'll say that my dad was a great sport. Um, he ended up spending a lot of time with me um, as we were kind of unpacking and learning uh, a bunch of things. So that was, that was obviously a, a, a great experience. So then fast forward way forward to Pepperdine. You know, I went to Pepperdine to liberal arts school. Um, I, I didn't study computer science per se. Um, and the reason was I knew my desire was to apply software to other industries, not necessarily just to be a CS major uh, kind, of, kind of classic track. Interestingly though, going to a liberal arts school, I knew coming out of school that I was really passionate about starting companies and I wanted to kind of um, develop that. But my folks really encouraged me, um, go work for the biggest company that you would like to work for so that you can get some important lessons of what it's like to work for a big company before you slog away years and years and years on end in your own thing. And I, it was really great advice. And, um, uh, you know. You ended up in Oracle. I ended up in Oracle. At the time, the two biggest software companies were Microsoft and Oracle. And what I liked about Oracle fundamentally is that it's a data, you know, it was a database. It was only a database in an ERP company at the time. Now it's so much more, but um, you know, I, I graduated school in 95, 96, uh, went straight to Oracle, worked there for a few years. And um, so did, would you say now, looking back, that working in Oracle actually shaped you oh, for in, sure. in, a, in a way? 
without a doubt. Yeah, you do learn probably how they could position themselves, yeah. uh, where did they stand, and some tricks you, and traits you learn. Yeah, I mean, you can see the DNA of Oracle in the things that make me tick, and maybe I went to Oracle because those things made me tick already, maybe those things got developed over time, who knows. Um, but this was, uh, so it was 96, 97, 98, um, that I worked at Oracle, and when I was there, um, I, I worked in effectively this kind of solution SWAT team. And what was intriguing about that, again, liberal arts school, but happened to know how to program, and so there was kind of an interesting combination. Um, when I went um, to Oracle and got this job, the job was to go to the tier one clients of Oracle and to do whatever they needed even if the product doesn't do that so that you okay. can maintain owning that customer relationship okay and then to throw all of that over the fence to the development team and help the product management team understand what the client was needing so that they can then build that as a standard supportable product stack so would you say that's like the, the, the um, culture of the company that was there by made by the founder the, the larry right yeah he was there to keep the customer and make sure that they get what they need. For sure, well, I'll say, what Oracle taught me was a, just a, a, a fantastic focus on um, kind of platinum level sales execution. I mean, Oracle is well known for phenomenal sales execution. Um, obviously also terribly technical. Um, after I was in this, in this group for a couple of years in this SWAT kind of group, the thing that, um, I ended up doing next was um, I was in the product management team at Oracle mm -hmm. and I had very few but I did have a few um, interactions uh, with with different senior leadership and um, you know one meeting with Larry that was it <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but it was three years later right <laughs> yeah. on the highest position possible I assume right well it was small team yeah yeah team. no and that's not to imply that he wasn't involved he was very involved it's just uh, you know it's a big company yeah but but the reason I bring that up is to say you know his fingerprints certainly at the time were very much all over that company and that was also another um, I think learning experience to me that Companies are not just institutions that run on their own. Companies are a function of the people that run them. Mm -hmm. And if you're a passive executor, um, the culture is a certain way. If you're a very active executor, it's a very different way. And certainly Larry is well known for being more active than passive. And um, I think that also formed me. You know, yeah. if you care about the outcome, you'd be there and you'd be present. Exactly, that, that's what made uh, Oracle stand out uh, from some things that I know personally Oracle is the one company that really, uh, at the time, was pushing boundaries of mm. what what the industry is at the time. For Everybody sure. used their software uh, to do so many things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was it's the premier stack. And if you want to have the best paid job, you know Oracle product. I mean, it's it's just a culture. It's more than just a product. And it's a I family. Think, yeah, I think that's awesome. And. In this, in this kind of SWAT role, what was intriguing um, was here I am right out of school, super young. Um, there is a track, a career development track that most companies, all companies really follow if they're big, like an Oracle. But because of the unique nature of this kind of SWAT group, you had a bunch of um, very young people quickly accelerating in their career faster than the traditional track would indicate. Mm -hmm. And the principal reason was because the internet was transforming from client server as a computing architecture. And so all the kids at a school knew far more mm -hmm. about next gen architecture than the tenured, you know, more experienced um, individuals who were on the team. Yeah, uh, senior management. Yeah, yeah. completely agree. And so in that context, I ended up having an opportunity that I never would have had uh, but for the timing dynamics to lead teams in, in my young age on these really interesting projects. So we uh, I had a team that I managed that was the first uh, web commerce system where you could buy a cell phone and have it shipped to you on FedEx in the world. Wow. And that was for a company called AirTouch, which then later became Verizon. Yeah. And uh, we built that system. The first uh, virus deployment system for Symantec was actually built by a team I was on that worked for Oracle. It was for an Oracle account. So first time you could actually get 
automatic virus distribution for Symantec was through this system. Um, so we did a, a ton of firsts in that, in that effort. Um, I remember a, a particular example, um, again, this is all just part of this kind of fo what formed you or, or how, did, how did you develop these, these interests and passions. Um, I found myself on a, on a Thursday afternoon getting called into my boss's boss's office um, saying, we've got a very interesting project. Um, need to get you on a plane this afternoon. You're going to London. <laughs> on your way, we need you to build with this team a prototype of this commerce system, but we need to make it work on TV. And, the, and it, was the, it was the pitch to offer interactive TV using web technologies for B Sky B. And the meeting was Monday uh, with the board of directors to pitch Oracle's capacity to deliver an interactive TV commerce experience in 1999 or 1998. So you had uh, potential customers and everything before the product um, was this, made. Yeah, I mean that's how that's, that's how, how the sales Oracle. Works. Yeah, that's how <laughs> the Oracle was running, right? That's how right. they were. But it was a unique project. I mean, obviously, there's a ton yeah, of yeah. Ton product. It's all done and selling at scale. But this is one of these kind of flat planting moments of Oracle wanted to be the interactive TV framework that was going to be pitched, and you know, ended up not sleeping on the plane. Me and Few other guys were coding on the plane, the actual prototype. We then were in a conference room, much like this, in the hotel at the, at the airport, Heathrow. Finished developing it over the weekend. Pitched it on Monday morning. Uh, board of directors, you know, Ray Lane, who was the CLO at the time, was in that meeting. Uh, so it was incredibly exciting for mm -hmm. you know young young guy right out of school to have that kind of interesting experience, and that opened my eyes to how the corporate world. Yeah, passion meets scale. And that was really intriguing to me. Wow. So uh, after Oracle, you started MCO mm -hmm. and you started Play Expert. Uh, those are two great businesses. Uh, for example, Play Expert got acquired by Razer. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows Razer in Argus, right? The biggest manufacturing. Uh, company and lifestyle brand in the gaming industry. Now uh, building toasters. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, what you can tell us about these two your entrepreneurial yeah. uh, ventures that went to be extremely well. I mean, uh, extremely good, successful early career. One exit, second exit, and now it's the biggest one of all. Yeah. Well, to be fair, um, you know, in the context of Play Expert and Encode, relatively small deals in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, um, Plexpert was uh, largely seed funded, uh, MCO was largely seed funded um, in terms of its kind of backdrop. But w what was interesting to me in both of those companies is it was really about um, what I saw as a kind of transitionary uh, element of, of compute. And in the Plexpert example, uh, excuse me, in the Encode example, what we were building was measurement software sounds familiar, right? Mm -hmm. You're building measurement software, but for um, IT systems. So availability of systems, response time of um, uh, app server calls. And the whole reason we existed was because traditional tools did not measure these um, app servers that were running on Java. They only measured like system, you know, operating system metrics, they only measured memory, they weren't looking at um, the kind of in Java JVM stats. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what we built was a super cool bytecode injection technology that, that um, uh, looked at response time of these app servers, which was largely um, unseen by IT operators. So these IT operators were blind. Fast forward to Kachava, you know, we're doing very similar things, but instead of measuring IT systems in a data center, we're looking at your media spend. So there's a, obviously a common theme around how do you give more visibility to things that previously were blind to. Okay, so let's learn something about Coachella today. So let's talk about who is using Coachella? Who is Coachella made for? Yeah. Like many people uh, can recognize a beautiful logo, that yeah. star, uh, of, but who is actually built for? Who be have benefit using Coachella? Yeah, so we have really found a lot of success uh, initially in the States. 
um, but we've been continuing to expand globally, um, both in this office in China, as well as Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, and in Europe. Um, but our, our roots are in really serving tier one brands in the United States. And the companies are kind of a who's who list of, of tier one logos. So in terms of media and entertainment, we have NBC, CBS, ABC, Disney, Turner, um, we have Netflix. Uh, in terms of Germany, we have DAZN, which is the number one streamer in um, uh, sports uh, out of Europe, but now global. Um, we have um, in, in gaming, we have companies like Machine Zone, who have been uh, fundamentally the standard setters of what it means to grow at scale. And they really have relied on our tech for years in terms of that basis. We have um, companies like GSN Game Show Network. Uh, we have um, a number of indies. We have a number of mid-tier. Um, a very large growing group is the hyper-casual segment within the gaming space. Uh, margins are so critical in that hyper-casual dynamic that understanding revenue is um, really an important thing early. Uh, in terms of QSR, which is quick serve restaurants like fast food restaurants, yeah. McDonald's, Burger King, Chick-fil-A, Dunkin' Donuts, um, uh, and a number of others. So that success has um, kind of been reflective of a tier one brand that cares about brand and performance together. And there are a number of um, growing companies that, that kind of think of themselves as we're, we're just a small company and they kind of self-discount and they say, well, you, you serve these really, really high-end companies. Um, certainly I could just, I just need something basic. Mm -hmm. And what we've discovered, and I think it's largely because of our experience in the game space, and I think this will really resonate with you as well as your listeners and viewers, in the hit-making business, you don't always know on day one when something's going to be a breakout, right? Yes. I think this is so important for all, all the people in our industry, is all the people who are now starting, the, 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 when you have a dream that mm. you want to build something, you're really going on a path of building something. You not, you're not necessarily sure what services you need or what can give you a real edge later. From what I know, Coachella has some freemium services that's right that's available for everybody to use and uh, they can upgrade later that's right? right so can you tell us something about that yeah so uh, the, the solution is called free app analytics and we absolutely took the page from a freemium kind of free-to-play model from gaming and the premise is that um, there is no solution on the market today with the exception of free app analytics mm -hmm. that allows you to measure across Google Facebook, Snap, Twitter, and 4,000 other media sources with a free solution. So let me be once again specific. Coachella solution, uh, Coachella has a freemium solution That's right. that will allow you to track everything going on in your ad spend, yep. right? in your user acquisition strategy, with completely free yep. until you reach the point where you need some additional features and you can uh, just go, go for those features when you are ready, right? That's right, that's right. And it's really important to note, the only reason we feel comfortable having this free solution is because of how many enterprise features we have above and beyond the basic attribution and analytics. Okay. And when you start to scale, you're gonna need those features. Oh, okay. And it doesn't mean that it's a bait and switch, it doesn't mean it's a trick, it's not a trick at all, but everyone needs to have something basic when they start, and we wanted to have that basic thing available to the ecosystem. And then when they want to start taking advantage of these additional features, they can flip the switch and activate So if I understand correctly, you had that built baseline, right? Mm -hmm. And then you were serving the top tier customers. That's right. And you were learning on their problems. That's right. right? Probably in the middle of the night, they're calling you with a problem. Hey, fix That's right. this, fix this. I have this problem, I cannot see, you need this data, I don't know this. And you were went to fix all the problems for them, right? right? And then now you are like open door, say, hey, everybody can use this basic feature. That's right. When you get to the point where you need advanced features, That's right. you can reach out to one of our 
people are they're already there it's in the system it's the same sdk you don't have to upgrade and the beauty of that is that um you never know what's going to be a hit and some of the you know most successful game developers i know um, they always remark that everyone says oh it was an overnight success and they always kind of um chuckle about that because it was an overnight success made up of 15 failures prior. Mm -hmm. You learn these really important lessons and then you want to apply them. And, uh, you know, measurement probably is one of the most important areas of focus, even though it's the last thing thought about when you're thinking about your growth strategy. Because if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what's working in your cycle and your funnel, and you don't have a tool that actually even supports the notion of a funnel, then how in the heck are you gonna know where people are dropping off and where they're failing? So the, the first thing is try to know what you don't know, yeah. right? Yeah. And the, the, the Corchava's position is with a proper um, tracking tool, and yeah. measurement tool, yeah. you're able to actually learn the things you don't know. That's right. And, and a few years ago, to be totally honest, we had so many tier one customers and all of them were so advanced when we would talk to new prospective customers we would tell them all about what we were doing and i'll, I'll just give you a basic mm -hmm. example one of the views that we have is a r squared correlation graph and it effectively illustrates the relationship between impressions to clicks to conversions mm -hmm. and that conversion could be a download it could be level two complete, it could be a registration, it could be whatever, right? Well, if there's not correlation between an impression to a click to a conversion with a particular media source, then if you put more money into that media source, you cannot guarantee that more outcome will happen. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the mobile user acquisition space that you know very, very well, is that it's the wild west. And unless you can plot all of your media sources in an r squared graph to show correlation of your media so that you know where to spend, you're kind of flying blind. We would go into a new studio, relatively new indie studio, we talk about r squared correlation graphs, and their eyes would glaze over. They wouldn't know why they need to even know that, what to talk about, and they were confused. And so our, our lesson learned was, just give them a tracking tool, and then let them progress in their maturity and we have all the, we have years of maturity for them to grow into, but let's just give them something free that's easy to start with. So, guys, go to Coachella website and start learning about it. We're going to have more about that. Now, I, I have a, another question. There uh, are some of the developers that I personally know uh, have raised a few questions. Is yeah. if they change their existing tracking tool, mm. is there uh, any data loss going to occur for that? Is it possible to change their tracking or measurement, uh, yeah. some, something that they use and they might lose some data? Yeah, great, awesome question. Uh, if you're not asking that question, you're not asking the right question, so I'm really glad you brought it up. Um, if you are moving from another uh, tracking tool to something other than Kuchava, I'm not sure that that's possible, but in the case of Kuchava, uh, we have this notion of a traffic import tool and it works across AppsFlyer, across Adjust, it even works across any um, kind of general structured uh, S3 bucket. Okay. So even if you have an internally built tracking tool, you can actually bring that data in through this traffic import utility. And here's why it's important. Certainly graphs and charts are important, so you can show specifically like 15 month views. Remember, 15 month views are important if you've been around for any duration because you want to see seasonal cycle changes, not just one week over another week. Um, the second thing it does is that it, it ensures um, app deduplication or device deduplication. Mm -hmm. So in the world of mobile user acquisition, um, largely the currency is around uh, kind of a cost per install basis. Some of the more sophisticated folks are more impression based, a, 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 a non-sophisticated approach is more of a CPI based, but that, that's fine. Um, the, the, and CPI being cost per install. If you've already paid for a device or a device is organic, 
-hmm. you certainly don't want to pay for it twice because you lose measurement tools. Mm -hmm. And so part of the reason you have this import utility is so that you can deduplicate all of that and ensure that you're not repaying for them all as you move over. So um, the quick answer is yes, we have the ability to, to import data from other vendors' tools as well as internal tools. It's useful for analysis and it's useful for um, data deduplication. So, for example, do you have, if somebody is moving the data, do you have a support team? Do oh, you yeah. have somebody they can reach out to, they can assist them, right? Help them along the way? We do. We, um, we actually are, uh, aside from kind of the premium nature of our technology and all the features, we're really well known for our CSM team, our client success management team. And part of the reason is because we, uh, you know, our heritage is serving these tier one clients, um, culturally as a company, we're used to working with companies who have lots of questions at all hours of the night. And so as an ethos, we're very focused on not only responding to an issue, but really having this notion of a, a dedicated pod, pod model. So for example, when um, one of our normal kind of enterprise clients calls in or has an email, that email is not automatically in some ticket management system that gets triaged by whoever is available to answer the question. We think context and continuity is really important. And so the same pod serves the same client base throughout their lifespan. Um, sometimes we sh shift things around for career development of different people, but, but by and large, it's the same general pod. And the reason uh, we do that is context. You don't, as a customer, want to re-explain your implementation and then ask your question in the context of that implementation approach. There's nuances on how each one of these deployments are set up. So customer comes in, wants to move from another tool, um, wants help with the traffic import tool. There's context and continuity in that process with the team. Awesome, awesome. Uh, while we're in the data uh, kind of space, uh, tell me, some people have saw that uh, your data is kind of different from Facebook data in some mm. way. Uh, what's going on there? Uh, yeah, you know, um, I, I heard that uh, as well. And there's, I think there's a few things that are at work there. So um, obviously the devil's always in the details. Um, we've had co companies who have moved over to us and they uh, did not use the traffic import tool. Mm -hmm. And um, then they ran media using Kachava and also on Facebook. And then the numbers were not the same. The reason was many of those installs that are engaging with the, the, the audience, um, uh, or those devices have already been attributable. And so the numbers end up being different. And so that traffic import capability is really, really valuable and important. And, and we kind of think of it as a requirement. The second scenario is, you know, Facebook and Google don't know each other's data. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when you're buying media on Facebook, you're also buying it on Google. And um, it's impossible and it would be too much to ask for Facebook to know what um, audience reach exists with Facebook versus Google and where the overlap exists. Mm -hmm. Now, other measurement tools, again, a bit more commodity and a bit more basic. Um, the way Facebook and Google both work is they're what we call self-attributing networks. So they both individually claim what they um, believe they should take credit for based on a touch point mm -hmm. with that audience. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. They make it very clear that that's how they work. Both of them work that way. So if, for example, you engage with an ad for a particular developer on Facebook and then later um, engage with an ad on YouTube, you're the same person. Both companies are gonna claim you. And some of our competitors, again, a bit more commodity and basic, the claim just goes to both vendors. Now, um, contractually, uh, we too have to give the claim to both vendors because they both had some kind of a touch point. But from a visualization and a data model perspective, we actually show who is the true claim and who is the false claim because of audience overlap. Mm -hmm. So we'll actually tell the advertiser, yes, Facebook and Google both touched this person, but the most recent person uh, oh, touch was okay. Facebook. Okay, okay. And so what ends up showing up on the kind of top level view of the leaderboard is Facebook, 
even though the claim got given to both Facebook and Google, Facebook got the true claim, whereas Google, in this case, this fictitious case, got the false claim. So, um, to, to make sure that everybody understood uh, what is actually going on, is that both uh, uh, Google and Facebook, for example, are going to show you ads through their probably network audience, right? Yeah, yeah. And you're gonna see on, on the one uh, web page reading some ball of the ad from Facebook, you're gonna see the same ad on the other web page shown by Google. Yeah. In case of Coachella, you take the last uh, interaction with the specific user as we, the one who owns the... We make it actually configurable. And this is another one of these mm -hmm. things that's kind of crazy about us. Everything in our system is configurable. So the default is last click, just because that's an industry standard. Mm -hmm. um, but you can you can make it a different configuration. I mean, we're as an example, we're the only uh, measurement uh, technology in the mobile space that supports fractional attribution. Mm -hmm. So you can actually give fractional credit to the first impression and fractional to the last click. Well, and everything in between. Mm -hmm. Now, you need to have a fairly uh, uh, mature uh, media mix modeling philosophy for you to actually configure those things. Again, early game developer doesn't really care about that. Mm -hmm. But if you grow and you're spending a million dollars in ads a month, mm -hmm. you really care about that. Um. While we're still talking about data, there is another Sorry. question. Yeah, totally fine. <laughs> that's, that's what our audience wants, right? Yeah. That's what everybody will be asking me in terms of, is it, uh, is it possible that you save uh, data up to 90 days and uh, why not more, why 90? Yeah. What's the, what the story about that? Yeah, um, well, we, we save it longer than 90. Um, our, our closest competitor saves it just to 90. No, okay. Our second so closest, to... yeah, they say that only 30 days. Okay. Um, we have, we make it, uh, we kind of have a standard and then we, we give customers the option to pay uh, an additional fee if they want to make it longer, but you can make it as long as you want in terms of persistence. Now, when we're talking about this data, because this is a specific data, uh, does Coachella own all the data from the users or who the, the data actually belongs to? Awesome question. The data is owned by our customer. So this is a really important differentiator um, because we, we really have um, kind of two core models. We have our enterprise customers. They pay us. Um, they're, um, they're using our technology for data management, for measurement, for a variety of different things. We are stewards of their data. We, um, we have a system, a SaaS-based system, where their data is sharded and unique to their environment. It's not intermingled, it's not sold, it's not anonymized and given out. Their data is their data. I would be um, crucified, personally, if we ever did anything with companies' data that are our enterprise customers. Now, put that to the side. You remember our free product. We have this free product okay. that has limited enterprise features, but it has all the attribution and analytics that you'd ever need as an early developer. Um, the way we monetize that free product is we get a first party license of that data for those free uh, product customers. Okay. And we um, sell that in an anonymized, uh, targetable fashion to our enterprise customers. Mm -hmm. And again, like we talked about earlier, if you're an early developer, you want a free product, that's a fantastic one. Usually early developers don't care about their data because they don't feel like they've got all that much. But because we have so many customers that are using this, it ends up being a lot together. And so it is quite valuable, but only when it's all together. Mm -hmm. And then we made that available to our enterprise customers as a, a mechanism to monetize the systems and infrastructure to support the free product. Awesome. So to, to clarify for everybody, right? If you are using freemium uh, uh, product of Coachella, mm -hmm. uh, probably smaller developers have small data. They're just expanding. They're just looking for product market fit. Yeah. Uh, Coachella would use this anonymous data to gather together from all the uh, developers, and that would probably offer to some uh, uh, feature or to some. Uh, uh, to some companies who want to get this data, that would be right. uh, one of the business models. 
and that's what actually makes them run that premium feature for you so you can while you have a small data very small one you're on the freemium model your kind of data is anonymously uh, used when you move to the uh, paid version right that then turns on that that uh, is gone and you own your own data that's right basically once you become uh, uh, any tier so uh, that's right customer okay that that's quite a lot uh, now uh, you guys have decided to expand your business in china yes you're moving to china there are many talks about uh, u.s companies having a problem coming to china there are so many like rules regulations how is kuchawa dealing with, the, with these issues and is there anything you feel it's like burden for you yeah. uh, uh, or do you feel that because you're a u.s company you have any problem coming actually to change yeah, that's a, a great question, very thoughtful. So um, I think the Chinese market is a, is a phenomenal one and it is so competitive in, a, in particular in the game space, in the commerce space, just in mobile in general, that um, every company in mobile is looking for that competitive advantage to grow uh, and to um, leverage their position. And so in many ways, China is like a perfect um, environment for us as we grow and expand as a company. As I mentioned earlier, our historical strength is in the U.S. and U.S.-based companies. Um, it hasn't been necessarily in China, and we think there's a huge opportunity. In terms of problems or, or challenges that we face to date, we haven't, we haven't really. I think the biggest one is um, getting our, our message out across this, this ecosystem. So there are a few companies that um, kind of came into the Chinese market early. And um, um, I would argue subsidized their price point to get adoption. Oh. And then once that adoption started to build, um, um, they became uh, quite well known and, and kind of um, standard across a, a variety of companies. The interesting thing is those companies, um, those advertisers that are here in China, I would argue we're in kind of a, a third chapter of this larger mobile story. I don't know how many chapters there are, but I think we're in the third chapter. The first chapter was everyone was in kind of R&D phase and playing around and it was easy to get to the top of the charts. Mm -hmm. And measurement was important um, but not critical. In chapter two, everyone realized how important attribution and measurement was. So everyone wanted to tick box the box, but they didn't quite know what they were ticking. They said, I'm told I need to know attribution. I'm told I need to have attribution. I'm gonna get it. But they didn't really know what they had. And now you mean the market is maturing now. And we're in chapter three and it's now maturing. And those people, they're now realizing that they bought a car, it had four wheels, it had a steering wheel, there were certain places to sit, but it wasn't a lot of features and didn't really help them do nice, comfortable, long haul trips, if you will. So if they wanted to go to the beach with this car, basically they can, but if they want to go back home, there's not enough fuel in the tank. You could come up with a thousand analogies. Uh, the, the, the basic premise is that I think everyone in chapter two knows they need measurement, and more importantly, they now know that details matter. And um, it's really critical to them that they can link those details to their own success for them to make more money. And that's the interesting connection I think we've made with many of our customers. But I think in the China market, the opportunity is to help articulate that you can actually make more money on the same ad budget if you just have better tools. If you just understand better your funnel, right? Well, it's, it's funnel, it's attribution logic, it's fractionality, it's correlation of your media spend against results, it's LTV analysis, lifetime value analysis, it's, it's all of it together. And the, the interesting thing is, it's not enough to have a marketing campaign to say, we have LTV analysis. You actually have to do it. 
Mm -hmm. And it has to actually be functional and, and usable and repeatable. And I think that's what we've done really well. Awesome. That's a really, really uh, good, actually, good understanding of the industry in China. Mm -hmm. uh, that's awesome. Awesome subject. I really like it. Um, now, I have some other questions that I have prepared here. I'm familiar with the exchange. Yeah. You guys are doing on uh, blockchain, right? Yeah. So you also have some blockchain projects that I'm very excited to to learn a little bit more and fraud detection, prevention, and uh, what's going on on there. Yeah. So you could argue fraud is a uh, a banner um, thing that everyone in media and advertising cares about, should care about, should be addressing. Um, we have some. We have the best tool set in finding and removing fraud from the equation. We, we are consistently uh, removing between seven and fifteen percent of your media spend due to fraud, which you can then re-associate to other media that uh, gets optimized. I could talk for hours about fraud, but it fraud is a is a whack-a-mole exercise. A uh, new fraud tactic gets produced. We find the solution yeah. for it, customers protected. It's okay. like it's like antivirus. Yeah. We're always building more algorithms and uh, we've always been the most detailed and the most deep. The interesting thing about blockchain mm -hmm. and the reason why we, we started building this, building blockchain technology for digital advertising is not orthogonal to our core business. Mm -hmm. It's very much in line with our core business and here's the reason. In digital advertising, the supply chain, that is, the publishers that actually have the ad unit slots for which ads get shown, mm -hmm. is multi-tiers deep, and there is zero custody chain. And what I mean by that is, you don't actually know, if I buy media from you, that you are the actual source of that media, or if you turned around and bought it from them, and they turned around and bought it from them. And they turned so around and basically them. you're saying is when I go to Google, for example, mm -hmm. and I purchase some ads, I don't yeah. know where those ads are shown, right? That's right. That's, that's the demand side of the visibility into it. That's right. You don't know where those ads are shown. And Google's solution to that is don't worry about where it's shown. Just use UAC and your campaigns will be automatically well, what, optimized. What, for example, if I want, I don't want my ad shown on some website. That's true, that's true. And I, I do think they, um, you know, they, they do a very good job of things like brand safety and, and ensuring that um, that's covered. But, you know, Google's job is to make it simple for you to spend money with Google mm -hmm. and to deliver on your I.O., on your insertion order. Facebook's job is for you to be able to spend money at scale and deliver on that I.O. When you saturate those two companies, in other words, you've bought every possible impression of the audiences that you care about within those two companies, mm -hmm. you need to find more audiences. Right. They only really represent 40%, and I know that's a big number, but they only represent 40% of available engaged audiences, which means there's 60% out there but that 60% is like fishing in a swamp. Mm -hmm. You can't see much. You're a little bit nervous about a snake that's gonna get you. You know, it's a little bit questionable. Undiscovered terrain, right? That's Un right. Unmanaged market, right? Unmanaged market. And that's what's beautiful about a Facebook and a Google is their managed market. So when we invented this concept of exchange, the notion was, what if we built an open source blockchain protocol-based mechanism for a managed marketplace. And in, in doing that, because we're a measurement company, we cannot be the ones who are running the marketplace because then we're biased. Mm -hmm. But if we make an open source blockchain-based protocol, what's interesting about that is publishers can introduce their inventory onto the protocol, buyers can introduce their demand onto the protocol, Matchmaking can happen through the protocol, and then uh, delivery and measured execution can be managed by third-party companies like Kachava. 
So whether you're buying on the blockchain or you're not buying on the blockchain, you're still using a company like Toshaba to help bring you those insights. The difference is if a company right now only trusts Facebook and Google, and they wish there was another company to be part of the kind of triopoly, if you will, mm -hmm. the, the, the vision of exchange is that it can be the third trusted channel made up of individual inventory that has a full chain of custody all the way down to the source and it's cryptographically backed because it's on blockchain. Mm -hmm. and how do you prevent fraud? I mean, we hear from our community a lot, they're buying ads on certain networks and uh, they're simply getting uh, uh, very poor performing uh, yep. uh, results. I mean, they Fake impressions, yeah. fake clicks. Fake downloads. Fake downloads, fake post install events. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. That's right. This is all about chain of custody. So, um, can you explain a little bit more about like what, yeah. what, what goes in that? Yeah, sure. So, when, when you um, are buying from a supplier and you have no confidence, there's not only no relational confidence, but there's um, not a technologically backed cryptographic signature of that confidence mm -hmm. you're going to judge that partner or that um, supplier in the context of what they deliver but you always have to do that test buy ten ten thousand dollar io test buy or fifty thousand dollar io test buy usually every network puts their best foot forward for that first test buy and they immediately ask for a half a million dollars a month the next month you know to you know start to put on the gas or some variant of that. Mm -hmm. um, the idea behind exchange is that from the place in which the ad is actually served on the actual publisher, that there's a cryptographic envelope that links that particular ad slot back to the source publisher, which then is part of the insertion order. So the notion of blending fake impressions or blending fake clicks from some alternative source is not really something that's there because there's a cryptographic signature associated to the identity of that source. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another example, and, and this is very related to the fraud stuff. Like I talked about earlier, we've got really the best tools in, in fraud mitigation and, and measurement um, and, and abatement, you know, remove it from the equation. That's because of what we have in our server side technology where we're looking at all the signal of impressions and clicks. But we also have something we call, um, it's an internal tool, we don't actually expose this, but it's called the app analyzer. Mm -hmm. What that is, is effectively a programmatic mechanism to run every single app in the app store and cycle through every single app across multiple regions and observe how it behaves in the wild. Mm -hmm. When we observe it, we see what signals are getting passed through the network. And without even touching the screen, these are actual devices running freshly uh, branded uh, or uh, freshly uh, instanced instances of the operating system. Without touching the screen, there will be um, programmatic ob observation of impressions and clicks that are getting fired from the device and no ad was shown and no one was touching the screen. And this is happening at scale. Wow. When we see the click, we actually detect who it's clicking through. And so it could click through to an affiliate network, which then clicks through to a different affiliate network, which then clicks through to an ad network, which then clicks through to a mobile measurement partner. And by doing that, we now have tracked the site IDs from the originating app all the way through the ecosystem to the actual MMP. Why is that interesting? We saw a set of apps that were broadcasting that they were the Lenovo uh, app, when in fact it had nothing to do with Lenovo. It was a completely fake click on a selfie uh, app, but it was um, broadcasting to the MMP that it was Lenovo. So if the advertisers only view into the ecosystem is what the mobile measurement provider gives them, they would think they got a click from the Lenovo app 
wow, that's high quality. All right, that's useful. When in reality, it was from the selfie app through three different layers of affiliate networks. So each one cannot re... They're all rebrokering. You could think of it as almost like click laundering. Okay, so it's like a chain of washing. You're this. washing the clicks. That's exactly right. right. Right, right. So this is this is fundamentally how fraud is done at scale. And what we've done by building our app analyzer tool is we've mapped out the whole industry of who's showing what signals through which partners. We then marry that on top of our fraud tools and we can see here's a company that is purporting to be this and they're not. And we can actually see what's happening. Now, in a blockchain world, Chain of custody means, instead of us having to observe that in the wild, you actually have a cryptographic signature that says, yes, this click is from this Lenovo app because they would not be associated with this account unless this cryptographic key matched. Okay, okay. Does that make sense, the difference? So now you have, if I understand correctly, you have uh, hardware, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, data on the hardware that yep. Yep. you are then comparing that to what they actually is transmitting, what they're actually advertising they are, yep. right? Then you are observing the other layers. The signals in the process. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the other that they're doing. And then you can see what are they advertising to be, right? That's uh, right. Where they are coming from. Wow, that's a, that's a long cycle to go around yep. to, to capture. So just on average, what, what's the percentage from your uh, data, from your knowledge today, what's the percent of uh, fake traffic going around? Do you have any? I do, it's pretty frightening. Um, so we protect all of our customers. Um, and I've, I've got a great slide and it, the slide is like a thousand laser, lasers coming from the left to the right. Okay. And then I've got a series of blocks that show all the different things that we do for defense. And at the end of the last block on the right, there's only four lasers that come out. And it's almost like a funnel of signal. So we built that as a visual display of what we're seeing based on volumes. The most outer edge of unprotected signal is 70% fraudulent. Wow, let's go again. So, you're saying that potentially somebody is spending ten dollars and only actually is getting three dollars value for yep. their ads. Yes. And the weird thing is that normally you think if I spent ten and I only am getting three, I would notice it and I wouldn't like that. The way fraud works in mobile and in advertising is that it's really sniping your organic users. And what I mean by that is the advertising is masquerading ads for actual users who are high intent organic installed users. And so they look good, they smell good, they behave good, they, they monetize, but in fact, no ad was served at all. And so the good fraud, the good fraudsters, what they do is they analyze who probably will install your app anyways, oh. and they just fire as many signals as possible to try so to get you're getting you're getting the impression is I'm doing good, I'm having users, the people are yep. the so you playing, think people I'm, are playing my game, right? Yep. Nobody's buying yet. Well, they, they yeah, and this is what's really interesting. That whole difference of I spent ten dollars and I only feel like I got the value of three. They don't feel that. They think they got ten. Or they, they in some cases, if it's like you say, good froster, they're playing, they got extremely good value. That's right. The wow. reality is, they just spent seven dollars on users that were going to be theirs anyways. If they put that seven dollars to work on actual net new audience reach, imagine how much bigger they could be. And that's the that's the play that we we really focus on with our clients. Wow, that's so so big. Uh, I think everybody uh, watching this 
you guys are ahead of everybody else. It's true. Like what, Just this little hour segment, yeah. Yeah, this is gonna get you propelled to space. Um, I, I wish then like many years before we knew that this type of service exists. Now, while we're on this fraudulent behavior, um, what, what I'm thinking about, if I have, uh, if I have built some kind of fraudulent tool that allows the traffic, mm -hmm. and there is somebody who can like detect me, is it is it that that like after you detect somebody, you can r roll them out? Mm -hmm. And for example, um, if I'm doing this whether on web or mobile, right? Um, how how would actually some company who's buying traffic stop? doing this yeah you can tell them like hey this channel has a fraud, fraudulent uh, traffic these guys are not delivering the right thing how would that actually go no it's a it's an awesome question so this is the beauty about having fraud detection as part of your attribution tool mm -hmm. when we see fraud we automatically remove it from the attribution waterfall so if someone is behaving fraudulently they're never able to get a claim to be attributed as the source. So what you're saying is, I go to Google, they give me a bill of 10 bucks, and I say, mm -hmm. no, 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 I have only three bucks for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that right? That's generally right. Google behaves a little differently, just no, like Facebook, course, because they're a self-treating mm -hmm. network. Let's say they were ad network XYZ. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're in a normal, independent um, ad network. The answer is yes. Um, more importantly, uh, the way our system works is the bill that you get from the network is only for the $3 because they never even hear of the signals that should have happened if a different measurement tool was used. So they couldn't send you a different bill. So we, we mute the signal from even being syndicated to the partner if it's fraudulent. Mm -hmm. So they can't even uh, do the feedback loop. And that actually serves the network as well because oftentimes the network is just as much of a victim as the advertiser. It's the, it's the sub-publisher who's trying to victimize. Where they are going for the traffic, right? That's right, that's So right. even they don't have sometimes tools that's, to identify they, they where the fraud, fraud come from. They usually right? don't. It's some small vendor somewhere yep. that find a loophole and that's they right. just blow it. And here's what happens. One vendor will actually configure to work with five ad networks through a mediation system. Mm -hmm. And they run them like a daisy chain until it stops working. And if something stops working, they just maximize to the other four. So it's, it's a very common approach um, to do it that way. The, the other really interesting takeaway that um, we've seen is that because of how strong our fraud tools are, we've noticed that there are publishers, these are the fraudulent publishers, who work with ad networks who victimize advertisers on other measurement tools more than our measurement tool. And the reason is, we believe, they can get away with it easier. And so it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because we have tighter tools, the fraudsters go to the easier targets. So would you, would you say that you're partnering with the very good ad networks in order to serve them and their customers much better, right? For sure, we're, yeah. we're certainly doing that. We're also seeing that fraudsters are gravitating to advertisers that use, that don't use Coachella. Okay. Because okay. they can get away with it. Okay, so if you're just now thinking about buying some ads somewhere, look for Coachella logo in the partnership line That's right. down there. Like if you see Coachella there, there, you can be sure that there is a blockchain whole That's right. pile stack of, of technology there blocking certain uh, misbehaves. Awesome. Right, wow. So what is the, the idea for Coachella in the next five years? Where, where, where the industry goes from here, from your yeah. perspective? Because you're so deep in this space tracking, uh, fraud protection, you have a blockchain, yeah. data is here. Where is this industry going, let's say five years? Yeah, tough to say in five, but part of the reason we've been investing in blockchain tech is because we believed 
three and a half, four years ago that it was going to become a thing. Mm -hmm. And it certainly has, and it's going to, I, we're still nascent. We're still like uh, baby, baby days for blockchain tech. I think it's going to become a, a, a real utility that's used over time. So I think in the next call it, let's say that in the next year, unified data management linked with attribution, linked with re-engagement, linked with push notification from one common system. I think that's going to become more of a thing that ad advertisers are going to demand. They're going to want one data model, one dashboard, one command and control system. In 16 to 24 months from now, our vision for blockchain will start to hit scale, I believe. Okay, so this is a... But it's a yeah, it's a long, this is a long play. It's not like blockchain is tomorrow. I mean, it's a long play. So I think it's 16 to 24 months. The next one, let's say next 36 months, we envision um, the world that we're in really focused around mobile, mobile apps, iPad, etc. But we have SDKs for OTT over the top. So we work on Roku devices, we work on smart TVs, we measure ads that are shown in, in smart TVs. Mm, we have an SDK that works on smart refrigerators because they're based on the Android environment. Um, we have an Xbox SDK, we have a PS4 SDK. So we live in a world where we believe all these connected devices are going to end up having a mesh of identity around households. So IoT would be... IoT, I think, starts to really kick in in 36 months. But not IoT that's been talked about the last three years. This is IoT where it's really about audience addressability. And that's where I think IoT has missed the boat. Unless you can associate how you advertise through this system, it's not going to be a system. It's going to be a utility. Mm -hmm. But if you can know how to advertise and target audiences, all of a sudden it's a real valuable thing. And so the meshing of um, connected devices within the household, connected devices within the car, autonomy of vehicles in the context of ads. Think of how much time we're gonna have when autonomy hits cars at scale. We're gonna have all this un, um, unmanaged time where we can just engage with ads. It's gonna be a huge opportunity. You know, Autonomous vehicles are gonna be the best billboards ever and everything can be personalized based on this identity revolution. I, I've, I've just uh, had one of my friends uh, send me some signals from uh, Tesla. Yeah. They just released uh, all, made public all their research they did in the previous three years. There's so much collaboration, what just you said. For I sure. Feel, uh, I, I feel that you're right in the tone, whether they kind of just were talking about. Well, yeah, and I, I, there's a, there's a, publication I respect quite a bit called The Information, and they have an annual autonomy conference, which is a one-day conference that talks about vehicles and transport and autonomy, and I've been going to that for the last two years, and I meet people that I know from other ecosystems and industries, and they're like, why in the heck are you here? And I'm like, pay attention to this, something's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I think you're, you're, you're tipping off on the same point um, that you're referencing the Tesla thing. I, the, the, there's a lot there and I think it's going to be interesting. Guys, this is uh, probably one of the best talks we had recently on our show. Awesome. I'm really uh, excited to learn even more. I hope to bring you more uh, ideas and more progress on what Kochal is doing, both here from Beijing, from China and from US and Europe, where the things are also happening. Um, for the end, is there anything you would like to leave some young developers? Mm. For now, I'm going back to the earlier of my days when we were like a three people, four people sitting around the computer and thinking what to do next. Yeah. How is Gochala important for them? Just some message or something that you feel they should um, they should have yeah. think about Gochala what they are thinking about. Well, first let me just answer a different question, uh, which is really about kind of the innovative spirit of an entrepreneur, whether you're young or old. Yeah, please. And that is that um, 
you know, MVP, 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 MVP. And, and the, the theme here is you a minimum want, viable product. Yes. Anyone yeah. miss that? Yeah. Yeah. So the great thing about an entrepreneur is that they believe with all their heart that the world is theirs based on this brand vision. The biggest liability of any entrepreneur is that they believe with all their heart that this grand vision is going to happen, right? So yeah. it's this best asset and best liability. In that context, what an MVP really does is it helps you focus on what's going to be um, the first proof point. And then with that first proof point, you can fund progress. And with that, you can fund progress. You know, we haven't talked about it at all, but Kachava is bootstrapped, and it is nothing short of miraculous that we have grown. If if I haven't mentioned to you guys, uh, Kochava is really a bootstrapped company. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. How many people do you have today? 140. 140 people, fully bootstrapped, uh, a company that's conquering the world in terms of brand safety, ad tracking, measurement. Uh, adopting new technology, blockchain going forward, yeah. uh, processing the data protection, uh, world class tier one brands use. This is uh, one of those dream stories, and I think this is just the beginning, especially now that when they are expanding in China. Yeah. Uh, it's really it, great. It, it is, and, and just to kind of put a bookend on that point, the reason I bring that up is the things that we're doing today, I have had in my head for years. But we didn't talk about them early. Part of it was we didn't know if we'd earn the right to be able to expand because we didn't focus and didn't execute. And even today, we have people who think that we're not focused because we're doing such a broad thing. They're like, why are you even thinking about blockchain? Just don't bother yourself with that. Just focus on this one thing, which is attribution. My, my philosophy is we're focusing on the thing that matters, which is what the customer is asking for. And that started with attribution, but it's gone to all these other things. Super important for every entrepreneur, but more important than idea, than funding. I think closely to the most important as a team is, is timing. Yes, absolutely. Timing. And I think nobody does it better than Coachella today, I guess, well, right? But, but timing is also a function of luck. So let's yeah. just, let's give credit where it's due. Yeah, of course, they're right. Wow. Yeah. Great. Uh, Charles, it was a pleasure to have you on our show. Awesome. You're welcome to bring us any update as they come. Sure. And uh, to you guys, uh, until the next show, share this with any founder of a game company you know. So if there is anybody making a game or doing anything related to the games in the, or any other industry on that matter, this is a one uh, episode you should pay attention to. Take care guys and see you the next show. Thank you.